Um, welcome everyone to the um, September, uh, let's see, where are, what date are we? September? Not quite. We're still August oh, 30th. August 30th. Oh my gosh, I'm already in September. In the August, uh, the August 30th school committee meeting for Hadley Public Schools, do I have a motion to um, open this meeting? Motion. Do you have a second? second? Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to um, start um, with any adjustments to the agenda. Annie, are there any adjustments? Uh, yes, I'm requesting that Ms. Dow does her presentations first when we get to presentation and discussion items. She has a child who will be attending new student orientation tonight and she'd like to also be there at Hopkins. And, and we really support parent engagement so that you get to go first. <laughs> and, and also we will be discussing disposition of two pianos that are no longer functioning at Hopkins. That's an added agenda item. When uh, we are discussing capital and we can do this under school committee requests, I'd like to consider um, pulling the capital request we currently uh, have before the town. We can talk about that more then. And I would like to add to action items, approving changes to a form. And uh, Tara can talk about that when we get to the policy set committee report. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much, Annie. Noted. Um, and so we're gonna start with the first item on our agenda, which is uh, open comment. And uh, before we begin, I would like to just remind us, uh, in fact, I'm going to just share my screen very briefly. Um, and just make sure that we are aware of public comment rules. Um, public comment um, limits the time of comment to three minutes per our policy. Um, and so we're going to um, stay on um, that schedule today. Um, it's usually related to business of the school committee uh, that's uh, being um, discussed uh, in, in this, that specific day, um, that specific meeting. Also, um, there is uh, um, no, um, uh, it, it's not necessarily a given that we would be responding to anything that comes up in the school, com uh, in the open comments, um, but we would factor it in obviously for um, future discussions. Okay, great. So let me just stop sharing my screen and see uh, if you would like to make a comment, raise your digital hand. I notice Melissa uh, Aloisi has had her hand raised for a while. Um, so um, let's go ahead and hear from Melissa. And I'm going to ask you to unmute. Thank you. Yes, I too want to go to the new into orientation as well. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking um, everyone, and I want to give a shout out to Lauren McGar. Um, she has been a phenomenal resource for my family during COVID um, and continues. She single-handedly has been the uh, main contact point for my um, daughter, who successfully was able to do credit recovery over the summer. And so she is, has graduated to eighth grade. And I just wanted to um, make sure that you all were aware of what, what a great job that that transition counselor had. And I really hope that um, you, you acknowledge her and the other support staff. Um, that's just really important to our family to let you all know that. Um, and then I wanted to know, I have a link to a, document, I can email it to the chairperson if you'd like, um, for the COVID discussion that you're going to have. Um, my public comment is regarding, um, I have some great concern over the 80% vaccination rate that you're considering after October 1st for Hopkins Academy, that if there's an 80% vaccination rate, um, which is what I read um, from your comments, I'm really concerned about that. Um, the article that came out this morning um, that my, I work for the Northampton Health Department and I'm uh, the database manager there. So I handle all health data coming in. And a teacher just had her mask off for a small period, quick period of time to read aloud. And 
a large percentage of the students became ill with this variant. And that's just really alarming. And I just wanted to make sure it's on your radar. Um, so I could email the link, like I said, if there was a chat, I was looking for a chat to send it to the chairperson, um, but I didn't see that. So I just really wanted to share as a parent, I'm very concerned about that. Um, that will lead to peer pressure. If it's not following what the town is saying or where you wear masks indoors, um, I'm just really concerned about peer pressure, um, no matter how old the child is, whether it's elementary school or high school. Um, so that is my two cents. I really hope this variant is very, very, um, what do you call it? Sorry, it's late, I'm losing my, my verbiage here. Um, it spreads very quickly and the fact that it, it will happen in our school system. I mean, this is a fact that I'm seeing. So please consider that um, having a mask mandate in school for all staff and kids while they're in the building um, and on the bus and during sports is very important to us. Great. And that's Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, we love hearing um, uh, kudos. Uh, about our educators. So thank you so much for sharing that. And if you had a note about that, please feel free to email that. And also uh, your comments about the masks are um, definitely important, um, especially as we're about to discuss that. So thank you for sharing those as well. Um, I also see a hand from Rachel Griggs. Um, Rachel, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. All right, thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time um, and for hearing me this evening. I'm the parent of an incoming kindergartner this year. Uh, and just briefly want to second what Melissa Aliosi just said about the necessity of ongoing mask mandates, just to go on record as a parent that fully supports the current mask mandate and the ongoing, and for those to be ongoing. Um, but tonight, I actually want to talk to you all about the importance of vaccination mandates and to ask the committee to um, institute a vaccination mandate for Hadley Public School District. Uh, it, it's my understanding that the committee does not intend to institute a district-wide uh, vaccination mandate. Um, and so first of all, I wanna say that there are so many things to applaud in terms of COVID precautions already in place in our district. Um, I commend the leaders of our schools, the administration and the teachers for the ease that you all have implemented this statewide mask mandate. Um, I commend the way that Hadley Elementary School has gone above and beyond in terms of distancing the students in classes and lunch times. Um, this is clearly above and beyond the state's vague recommendations. Um, and, I, and I commend our schools for doing this. Um, but the science overwhelmingly and clearly indicates that, that COVID vaccinations are safe and effective. And the evidence clearly indicates that increasing vaccination rates in our schools will lower COVID cases and, and protect us all, particularly the younger kids that, that aren't yet eligible for a vaccination. Um, and as the parent before me was saying, Delta has proven to be incredibly more contagious and more dangerous across the board for everybody. Uh, and so mandating vaccinations in our district will get us all closer to this goal of increased vaccination rates and a safer school for, for our children. Um, and there, there's no legal or ethical reason to not institute a vaccination mandate. There's a long precedent for vaccination mandates in school. Pfizer's vaccination has recently been giving full F FDA approval. Courts are already holding up vaccination mandates. And um, recently, a Massachusetts judge just threw out a challenge to the UMass system's vaccination mandate. Um, instituting a vaccination mandate would reflect an evidence-based, science-based approach to covid prevention, which we are already following. And so I call on the committee and the administration of Hadley Public Schools to continue to follow the science by instituting such a mandate. Um, I am concerned that there may be a very vocal minority that are pushing back against COVID precautions and mandates. Um, and, and so I just wanna be on record that I am full support of all COVID precautions our schools have implemented and any that we might further implement in the future. Uh, and, and Governor Baker has made it clear that his administration is unwilling to institute a vaccination mandate. So the state has really passed the buck on this. 
Uh, but they have empowered our local districts to make the choice to protect students. And so I just ask you all to, um, to step up as leaders in our community by instituting a vaccination mandate for our district. Uh, thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rachel. Um, to your first point about um, how hard the district works, I just want to take this opportunity to thank our administrators who have taken this very seriously. Um, social distancing, masking, all the all the precautions that have kept um, numbers at an all-time low. So thank you to um, all, all the uh, educators who have worked hard on that. And uh, I appreciate your words about the um, about making vaccines a mandatory um, part of the process. And Annie, I'm gonna ask you to look into that if you wouldn't mind um, and maybe bring it back to a future meeting. Thank you. Um, and I see a hand from Sarah Pegas. And Sarah, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Uh, did that work? You guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, wow. I can't following, <laughs> following those two, they covered a lot of points I would cover. Um, but I definitely um, second Rachel's suggestion that there's a vast vaccine mandate. Um, I have a son who has asthma um, and we're still working from home. So really the only exposure that he will have to potentially getting COVID is at school. So yeah, um, I definitely second both of their statements. Um, and I, I kind of, I don't know if this is going to be addressed. I know, I, I guess doing public comment first, you're just guessing. Um, so I would like to know, hopefully in, um, in Annie's report, what specifically happens when there's a positive in the class, in a class or, or in the school, wherever it is. And if we're going to know like last year, um, if there was a positive generally, and if there was any positive in the pool testing, like I want to know all of that. I don't want to, I want all information possible. So I just wanted to just say that in case I don't know what Annie's going to say. <laughs> so, so preemptively, I'm hoping she's covering those things um, tonight. And yeah, the only other thing was I was seconding. I would have said probably everything Rachel said. <laughs> and for sure, I can't remember the first person who was speaking, but I share both of their feelings. So yeah, I think that covers it between those two and those specific questions I'm hoping are addressed with a positive in the school scenario. Great. Um, that's all I have. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. You. I know um, I'm pretty positive Annie intends to cover that tonight, so you're in luck. Okay, and I wonder if there's anyone else Okay, seeing no other hands raised, I think that ends our open comment period. Thank you so much, everyone. We value your input and, um, and it, it means a lot to us that you take the time to come speak with us. Okay, we are moving on to presentation and discussion items. And uh, we've moved up, uh, let's see, we've moved up the principal update. Uh, is that right? So. Jen Dowd. Um, we Jen will actually do all things Jen Dowd. Any updates oh, and the summary of our handbook changes to anybody, even in our audience. If you are accessing, there's two ways you can always get to the agenda. In my newsletter where I link the agenda, then it's live and all the links are live and you can follow along or certainly the agenda that you find uh, on our website. But if you go to that uh, newsletter and just click on that agenda link in the newsletter you recently got, it'll bring you uh, to the agenda. And now Jen, your updates and your uh, summary of handbook changes. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay? Right, I'm coming live from my office. I just wanted to say first, thank you so much for letting me present first because I am a parent. I would like to go about the walkthrough, which we're super excited about um, in preparing for tonight and also for pretty much 
the entire summer. I'd like to give some updates as to things that we've done in the building to make sure that um, children transition nicely on the first day of school, which for many is tomorrow morning. So I just wanted to say how excited we are that the school year is upon us. Um, I'd like to thank a big thank you to the kindergarten and preschool team. Um, gardeners got to see their classroom. They got to sing a song with Miss um, Conklin and they were able to see their space and uh, have a quick morning meeting and then they went home. And one kindergartner even told me that was it. Can I stay? And which I told them tomorrow. Tomorrow you get to stay a little bit longer. So we had a wonderful uh, visit. And so I just want to say thank you to the kindergarten team for that. I also wanted to say thank you to all the families that participated in our family Zoom that um, I hosted last week. I thought it was a great opportunity to invite parents in, to ask questions, uh, to meet me virtually. And um, it was wonderful to see a lot of students on the call as well. So I was able to answer some questions from, from not only families um, and parents, but children as well. And so that was a very successful event. I'm glad people were able to attend. Uh, we also, big thank you to our PTO. Last night we had an ice cream social, um, which was fantastic. And the kids seemed like they were enjoying themselves. The adults seemed even more so to enjoy themselves because they were able to just let the kids run around and have some sugary treats and uh, over ice cream. So some students actually had some uh, ice cream soup right before they went to went home. Um, but it was a wonderful event. We had music, families were able to attend, and it was just a nice opportunity again to see families and to get back to a tradition which we have always hosted and we haven't been able to host in the past two years. So it was just a lovely, well-attended event. And I'd like to thank the PTO for doing that. I also would like to thank our staff, which we just completed our second day um, with staff back. And so we've had professional development. Um, we've been holding uh, meetings and trying to brainstorm and make sure that uh, the building is up and re ready for families to come in, not families, I'm sorry, students, um, and that families feel as though their kids are gonna be healthy and safe um, starting the school year. We we're able to discuss curriculum needs, um, work on schedules, students. By now, all families should have received updates to parent pickup and drop off procedures, schedule updates and needed materials to start the school year. We also had a wonderful donation of st from Staples. So we were able to also supply students with one to one boxes of materials. And so some families were happy to hear about that. Um, and really, all the all the teachers have worked extremely hard to make sure that they're communicating with families to make sure that families feel as though um, they have answers to their questions and have a good idea of what the school year is going to look like. And so I thank the staff for working with me. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one in this building right now, I'm still preparing for tomorrow uh, for students to come in. So a couple updates to the building that I wanted you all to be aware of. Um, we've worked extremely hard on making sure that we are going above and beyond to make sure that we have schedules that make sense for students that we're encouraged that we have been very thoughtful about um, our procedures and our health and safety protocols. And so I've been meeting with, with staff, I've been meeting with teachers. We still will continue to have desks in each classroom. They are distance as much as we possibly can make them distant. Um, we're gonna have a lot of things that look very familiar than we had in the spring. And so there's not a lot of changes in that. Um, we've extended and actually made a larger um, block for lunch and recess. And our thought around that is making sure that we have smaller amounts of students in the cafeteria and smaller amounts of students outside for recess. So um, we've looked at supervision to make sure that we have uh, appropriate supervision for those two blocks of time. The most questions that I get are usually around recess and cafeteria. So we recognize that some families might be anxious about that. Um, and we of course wanna make sure that we're doing the best job possible to make sure that our youngest students who don't have the opportunity to be vaccinated um, have as much distance in between each other as possible and that we're making sure that we're following our health and safety protocols like we did in the spring and all of last year. 
So the cafeteria looks a little different. Um, I've spent uh, a lot of time with the custodial staff and placing little pieces of tape um, every seat apart so that students know exactly where they need to sit. So there will be one full seat in between them. It does measure out to approximately three feet. Um, all students will be facing in one direction, which will be supported by um, airflow and fans. And so they won't be face to face. They'll be all staring almost in one direction out the door, which will be opened. Um, we're creating seating charts for not only the cafeteria, but in every classroom. So I've shared a folder with staff to make sure that we know where every student is sitting. Um, and so the cafeteria looks as though we're able to fit all students. We went from two lunches to three lunches. And so what that does is reduce the amount of students that are in those spaces. So again, our biggest lunch that we have is approximately 74 students. That's our fifth and sixth grade lunch. And they are properly um, displaced throughout the cafeteria. So we've reduced the amount of students that are in there. Kindergarten will be eating in the classroom. We actually have two classroom spaces where they'll be um, split between because we do have supervision for them and preschool again will be eating in their space as well. We do have a very healthy uh, preschool enrollment this year, which is exciting. And so there was a change in staffing and looking at what the building might need. And so we did go forward and that we have three preschool classrooms. Ms. Hermans, who was a kindergarten teacher, is now a preschool teacher. And so we were able to spread out our youngest students um, between three spaces. And we have our one kindergarten teacher, Ms. Conklin, who has worked extremely hard and does have the additional support of another uh, paraprofessional in that space um, and is also kind enough to take on a student teacher. So we have lots of hands to be helpful in kindergarten. Those are just some of the updates for the cafeteria. The general classrooms, again, we will have desks and seating charts. And then for recess, we did go with a three, um, three recess schedule. So again, fewer students outside. Classroom teachers this year will be expected to go outside with their classrooms. And so that is their supervision duty. So they will be watching their students, encouraging distancing when possible, making sure if there's any issues outside that the classroom teachers um, who are very, very experienced in these protocols and also their own students will be outside to monitor and to watch out for students and, and problem solve if problems should arise. So again, the kids that will be eating lunch together will transition and be together for recess as well. So those groups are kind of cohorted together. And so they'll be moving through the recess and lunch um, as a group. So those are the updates on kind of the bigger scheduling things that we've been working through as a staff. We're also obviously still adhering to the um, drop off and pick up in which we're asking families not to come into the building. We're delivering students for pick up and drop off right to the vehicles. And I've gone over this extensively, not only in email format, um, but also with my parent Zoom for folks that had questions about that. Um, so those are some of the building updates. And again, classroom teachers have been just amazing in reaching out to families to let them know of the changes, to answer any questions, and also to send out individual schedules and updates of anything that um, pertains to their specific classroom. Um, we're so lucky to live in a community where we've already gotten donations of wipes and, and hand sanitizer, and school hasn't even started yet. So I'm a little nervous about what parent drop off and pick up is going to look like because I know there's going to be bags that are going to be handed off to staff. And, and we thank all everybody for donations um, for, for those, um, you know, essential items that we need for our classrooms. And so we say thank you so much to our community. So those are the updates for the building. Um, just pause and see if anybody has any specific questions for me about the building updates. I did have a, a question around the uh, the recess um, uh, question. I had gotten an email from um, a parent, and I um, I did have a question about unmasked recess. But um, something you said really resonated with me as a means to try to mitigate um, the. Uh, known difficulty of keeping students away from one another. Um, and that is that their um, actual 
teachers um, will be outside with them. And I know, you know, there's the influence of lunch monitors, but then there's the influence of teachers who have the ability to really um, have consequences. <laughs> and so there, there's a different kind of, I think, um, ensure that the, the proper rules are being followed. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And I think just paying attention, I think, to whether our theory of keeping students apart and safe uh, follows through in practice and that you make any necessary adjustments as you see fit. That's one thing I have um, for a commitment to the families and to the staff is that we're constantly problem solving. And so if we should find that there are issues outside, if we should find that what we've put in place um, is not meeting our needs, um, we want to make sure that we're meeting regularly and we are talking to one another about problem solving and making sure that the students are staying apart. Um, Outside at recess, you know, kids love to play and they love to be one and near one another. And that's their time to also take off their mask for a mask break. If that's, you know, we have had in the past a masked um, recess that's not mandated right now, but it doesn't mean that we won't explore that in the future. Um, but what I can tell you is that the students have been uh, just exceptional last year in making sure that they stay apart from one another. And to your point, Humera, having the classroom teachers out where there's that follow through um, was really important. And we recognized that last year that um, the, the teachers know the students' names and they know they know a whole host of things that they uh, a monitor wouldn't know. And so it's really about having that communication and then also communication with the family. So I've encouraged families, if they're extremely concerned about their child taking their mask off um, during recess, and that's a, that's a discussion that families have had with one another, um, and that's important to them, that they should communicate that to the classroom teacher. So because they are will be outside and will be making sure that students are distanced, that they can have a conversation with the student to remind them, you know, you, you need to keep your mask on or your family wishes you to keep your mask on. So really um, making sure that there's that communication piece is important. And we also wanted to put it forward because we have a lot of social emotion learning goals that we want to address this year with the work of Michelle Watowitz as our coach. Um, and so having classroom teachers who are really experts and, and working really hard around the social emotional learning of students, having them be outside during a time where um, students are interacting with one another and trying to make friendships and trying to navigate social settings. Um, it's really important to have the classroom teachers outside. And then we have monitors who will strictly be in the cafeteria, who will just be making sure that students aren't, you know, turning and talking and that they're facing in the same direction. They're being mindful that when they go to throw out their lunches, that they put their mask on when they go to the trash bin. And so the protocols that we put into place, there will be monitors for that. And, and I will be hopefully in both spaces as much as one person can be. Terrific. Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. Any other questions for Jen? And again, I encourage all families to, to contact me. I've been on the phone um, pretty much nonstop for the past two weeks, just answering some of these questions. And even at the ice cream social, I had a family that said, oh, I'm so sorry to bother you. It's really not a bother. This is important to families. This is important to staff. This is important to me. It's important to all of us to make sure that the students um, feel safe and that families feel safe sending them. And um, it's never a bother to answer a question about anything. So I encourage families to continue to reach out. Thank you, Jen. Do you have another update? Uh, I do. I have an update on the handbook. Yes, uh, great. Yes, the, the wonderful handbook. Um, so we were updating that. Um, you all received a summary page. I'm just to refer to the summary page. Um, there's also a link that people can look at the summary page, but I'll briefly just go over that and then answer any questions if you have any um, particular to the handbook. Um, so really some changes that uh, popped up were around the area of grammar and spelling, making sure that um, you know all the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted. Uh, the table of contents had to be shifted because we had things um, added or subtracted 
contracted. And so we want to make sure that families can access the accurate information on the correct page numbers. Um, updating the school year. Again, you know, there were some updates, but not a whole lot from, from last year. Um, some things that we did update um, were things around the health and nurse information. Again, we did have, um, we had language in there of a nurse leader, which we haven't had uh, older. And so that position has gone away. Um, the time of arrival, uh, last year we were at 820 arrival. We've changed that to 815. Um, the reason for that is we were lucky enough to get some supervision and allow the doors to open up for family drop-off to be a little bit earlier. And that helped in several ways. One, we didn't have such a clog of cars in the in the morning. And I'm sure there are pa parents that were grateful that they could also drop their kids off a little bit earlier. So I did have some supervision in the in the um, gym. So students can start coming in, it just created a big old bigger window for students to be able to be dropped off. So that was an adjustment I had to put in the handbook. Um, same for changes in dismissal, just making sure that families communicate with us by 11 o'clock if there's any changes that we need to be aware of by the office, um, you know, it's just really important, especially during COVID to make sure just to classroom teachers, if there's any changes of dismissal, um, because there's so much planning that still goes into all of those um, beginning and end of um, to reflect Hopkins Academy. I think that that's a wonderful idea. Um, and really just, um, it promotes and celebrates students' ability for self-expression, but also has language in there that we want to make sure that students are um, being respectful and that their language reflects um, an environment of, of being inclusive. And so um, that language was updated. Um, and really any questions about attire should also be addressed to the building principal so that I can work with families to make sure that children um, are coming to school um, dressed appropriately. Of course, at the younger ages, I always laugh and think that the dress code should just be make sure you bundle your kids up when it's cold out and uh, make sure they dress for weather because when you go outside there's always that first cold snap where everybody's scrambling to find mittens and hats and such but um, another adjustment was the attendance policy we had in there that um, the language for remote learners obviously that's not a consideration this year so that language had to be taken out and then some updated information and DPH um, program website information for um, the health information. And you can find that on page uh, 21. And um, that's it. I think that was our last, yes, that was our last update. And uh, yes, sorry. Thank you. thank you. This is um, this is great. And also, geez, for the lights here. Um, <laughs> I, um, I really appreciate the summary page. And I just wanna, um, shout out to the wider window for arrival uh, at the elementary school, as you know, but I remember the rush to everyone getting there for that five minute window and having them not be late. So I really appreciate that you're creating a wider window. Thank you so much for, for doing that. And we're also really lucky this year to Humera to talk about working parents that we will have the opportunity to have after school care, um, which is the first thing that was, you know, we didn't have that last year. And so um, I just want to give a big shout out to, you know, everybody who made that possible, Dr. McKenzie for working, Miss Frost for working to get the after school program up and running for working families. Just so, just so great to see. Um, and they had a staff meeting today. So it was nice to meet some of the, the uh, people who are gonna be working in that program. So I'm excited to have that this year. That's terrific. I'm sure families really appreciate that. Okay. Any comments for Jen on the handbook? Just a thank you. Thank you so much with uh, kicking off the school year. Bye. Yeah, we're yeah, we're really excited. And tomorrow, I'm sure, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of, of get to bed early tonight. And I'll be telling my own kids that to make sure that they're well rested for tomorrow. But we really are excited to see the students. Great. Thank you. And Annie, do we need to vote on this? We do need to vote on the HES handbook. Do I hear a motion to approve the HES handbook? So moved. Seconded. 
And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, terrific. You have yourself a new handbook. Yay. And uh, go be with your daughter. Jen. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Good luck. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Take care. Okay, moving on to the next item of the agenda. Um, we're just continuing on down the line, are we not, Annie? Yeah. We're going to go into COVID-19 mitigation yes. strategies for 2021-2022. Correct. So the first thing, just to remind uh, families that every week in the news weekly newsletter, you are given a link to the copy of the dashboard. If that's information that you're interested in, you can wait until the newsletter comes out. You can also, it's a public dashboard. You can also just keep the link somewhere else or put it as a star in your drive and um, you can check it whenever you would like. The color coding on the dashboard corresponds with whatever agency has issued uh, thresholds. So for example, on case counts in the last seven days um, and uh, testing positivity and some of those other metrics on that first page of that dashboard, those uh, tie into the metrics and the color coding that's listed on the worksheet itself. So just the colors correspond. They're not just me having a random kind of Sesame Street moment on your dashboard. They correspond with what direction we want to go into um, regarding vaccinations and uh, testing positivity rates and uh, changes in case counts and uh, it, case counts over the preceding seven day period and increases in case counts uh, or changes. And I will include, as Sarah Pegas had asked, um, starting probably uh, mid-September or as soon as, uh, you know, hopefully some of this doesn't come to pass, but I will include information on uh, positive cases. I will not identify individuals, but I will identify by building um, uh, cases in buildings, just as I did last year. I'll notify families, just as I did last year, when we have a positive case, you'll be notified that we had a positive case. The email is, is pretty straightforward, but if you, if you are, or make this bookmark, this dashboard, um, because I will include in there Again, I just am, I'm trying to be as effective and efficient as I can be. And when we're getting the information out to people, I have to translate that information. So I, I minimize the amount of information I have to keep in there. So I can just reuse a message about a positive case. If you're trying to figure out where it is, then go to the dashboard because there'll be a, a block there that tells you. Um, and as one teacher used to say, oh, every week when I get the newsletter, I just take a screenshot of your dashboard. Then as soon as I get your email, I look at my screenshot of the dashboard and I know exactly where the case is. It's pretty straightforward that way. So that those case counts will be on the dashboard. Um, surveillance or pool testing data um, will also keep people informed of people who are participating, like percentage of people participating in pool testing. I'll add that information to the dashboard the percentage of faculty, of staff and students who are participating in our routine weekly uh, surveillance testing. And I will also add vaccination data to the dashboard for staff and students by building. So you'll have uh, access to those vaccination rates. Um, I think those were the primary things that Sarah had asked about and I was already planning on just as I did last year on including those in the dashboard. The vaccine clinic, we Transformative Health came out and did a vaccine clinic on August 27th. We will have another one on September 17th. Uh, so the vaccines that are av available are Pfizer and J&J. &J. Um, it is, if you show up on the 17th, if you're looking to show up on the 17th and you have specific questions about whether or not you can get a first dose of Pfizer, if this is the second vaccine clinic, uh, please email me directly and I'm, I'm happy to explore that for you. My assumption is that you can and then do a second follow-up with your card anywhere because vaccines are fairly, they're extremely accessible and fairly ubiquitous now. So know that Pfizer and J&J &J will be offered as they were on the 27th. We expect, thank you so much. I know that Allison and I think I saw Robin here. Yes, Allison and Robin are here. Thank you so much. Again, they are leading our testing efforts. Reject that. Sorry. They are leading our testing efforts, uh, pool testing efforts this year. We also um, are grateful to 
two other parents who are registered nurses, uh, Kara Wade and Leanne Cook. So I just really want to say thank you so much to Hadley families. When I describe the kind of um, contributions that our parents make in this district, I am the envy of surrounding districts. There aren't other places where registered nurse parents are leading surveillance testing. And if these folks weren't doing it, our school is really busy. There's a lot that happens at the beginning of school and their first and foremost job is to care for students um, who need immediate care in the building and they, they have a full-time job. So without these parents helping us, without uh, Robin and Allison who led the effort last year and this additional help we'll get this year, we, we wouldn't be able to do this. So I'm just so grateful for this community and how people step up. We had hoped to start the very first week of school. The state has wor is working with a new vendor. So we've had to change a lot of paperwork and file new paperwork and go through new training videos. So we anticipate we will start next week. Thank you to all the families and staff who have uh, filled out a consent form. I will continue to put it in the newsletter. It's pretty straightforward. You can sign up at any time and we strongly encourage you to do so. And that strong encouragement is really going to be made clear when I share my screen now, which are also linked in the agenda. Um, and I think that somebody had also asked about during public comment, what does it look like when there is a positive case in the school? So what you're consenting to when you consent to pool testing, also know that um, you're consenting to pool testing and just a brief explanation, it is similar to last year. These will be anterior nasal swab tests. They are not very invasive. Robin uh, demonstrated for folks last year at school committee, it's really not frightening at all. This is not a long stick. Students for the most part do it themselves. Very young children are uh, supervised and helped by one of our nurses if they require it. You can enroll in pool testing in as young as preschool. Uh, our our surveillance, our nurses will help students do this. This year we'll have students do one nostril, one nostril drop in a pool test tube uh, where there's multiple specimens in one tube. And then they'll do it again and drop in an individual tube. One wonderful thing about our, the new provider that the state is contracting with is that last year when a pool came back positive, all of the individuals in that pool had to then receive a rapid antigen test, which is not, extremely invasive, but it's a little more. The nurse administers that on campus. Now, uh, reflex testing will be done in lab. So if the lab identifies a pool as positive, they have all the individual samples, they will test the individual samples in the lab. Our goal is that as we get better and get more efficient, we hope that we can uh, schedule courier service early enough in the day that we might know that night. And my understanding is that the family would hear directly from CIC. Um, again, we're learning about a new provider and working with a new provider. Um, that could be extremely helpful to me and our other nurses uh, who were making frantic phone calls usually in the evening last year. So in, in lab reflex testing is a wonderful thing. And then, um, so what happens? The person who is positive, uh, we would notify again, we cannot identify somebody specifically um, and say, this person, first name, last name is tested positive for COVID. So we can't do that, but we can um, give information uh, as expeditiously as possible to close contacts. And um, we can, in a general way, share, share with the entire school community. There is nothing to prevent families from sharing this information. And I would say, um, you know, this is not something people should feel any sort of stigma about. I'm going to use myself as an example. I have not had COVID, but should I contract COVID? I am fully vaccinated, but there are breakthrough cases. Um, this may feel like TMI, but it would go in the newsletter. The reason I would put it in the newsletter is because I will remind people that a close contact is under six feet over 15, over 15 minutes within 24, within a 24 hour period, I may not remember every single person that met that criteria in the 48 hours preceding me receiving a positive test result. So um, certainly if families are comfortable being forthcoming about information and will help us with some of the uh, communication and contact tracing, that's, that's really helpful. So now if somebody tests positive, 
We communicate. They learn about it through pool testing or some other way. Uh, we communicate um, with, we identify close contacts and, um, and our first priority would be communicating with close contacts who are not exempt from quarantine and testing protocols. And I'll explain what that means. So people who are close contacts that have to either quarantine or participate in test and stay would be our first priority. It's making sure they understand that. And then I'm uh, making sure we communicate with people um, who may be exempted from these protocols because they should still monitor for symptoms. The easiest thing that people can do to help us is to monitor for symptoms. This document that you see, again, is linked in the agenda. It's also in the public folder under school committee materials and also as a link in, in the superintendent newsletter under updated guidance. The COVID symptoms list in bold, if you are a vaccinated individual, um, these are the symptoms that uh, see that Mass DPH is saying, please pay close attention to. If you are unvaccinated, any of these symptoms is what you should be paying close attention to. So if you are a close contact, I mean, all of us, please monitor for these symptoms of COVID-19. Now, who, well, who is, um, who is considered, who's exempted from, so the definition of close contact has changed under, uh, under new rules. Um, the definition of close contact does not change. The close contact remains under six, over 15, within 24. Under six, over 15, within 24. That applies to your regular life as well, not just school. But if you are someone who is asymptomatic and fully vaccinated and meets those criteria, you do not need to quarantine or participate in test and stay. These are not Hadley specific rules. These are DPH rules. So you do not need to participate in test and stay or quarantine. You may come to school. We are all masked now. So um, normally if, if you have someone in your household who is fully vaccinated and a close contact, they should remain masked outside of school as well um, for um, and CDC, I believe it's CDC says either 10 or 14 days, but we are all masked in school. You should make sure they're masked outside of school. If you are in the classroom, if you're in the classroom and uh, you are exposed to a positive individual in the classroom, while well, both individuals were masked, so long as the individuals were spaced at least three feet apart, you are exempt from testing and quarantine response protocols. If uh, there are essentially what the next bullet says is on the bus, close contacts per DPH. We have our windows cracked. We encourage them to be open as much as possible. And students must remain masked on the bus. Um, so there is no quarantine or testing requirement for any close contacts on the bus. And if you have had COVID-19 within the past 90 days, you're exempted from testing and quarantine response protocols. Now, if I were a parent, I might feel like, uh, hmm, I'm not so sure about like second bullet. I'm not so sure about that bus. Are we sure about that? And the one way, again, these are not our rules. And I do believe that DPH has demonstrated very solid leadership in this regard. And they did last year. And we were fortunate to have a, a fairly healthy year. And we didn't experience any student or staff with serious illness, hospitalization, or death. Um, and we're very grateful for that. The one thing that would really help us is the more people participate in pool testing, the easier it is for us to figure out if something here isn't working, right? That's how we pick it up. So please, please, please consider signing your children up for pool testing. I can't stress how helpful it is. It will also help us there was uh, one of the public comment talked about a concern, which is not uh, Hadley School Committee rule. I want to be very clear that um, the only way that a school can request to have the option of vaccinated staff and students unmasked is if they attest to the fact that 80% of staff and students in the aggregate are fully vaccinated, fully vaccinated, and then um, the school would apply to DESE to, to be cleared to do that. So this is not a Hadley School Committee rule. This is part of the, the mandate that just came out on masking. 
students right now, and we're still collecting information. At Hopkins, as of today, I was notified that we have 92 students vaccinated, which would be about 39% of the student population. So we'd have, I anticipate we will get more information over the next coming weeks, but it would not appear based on that. Um, well, we'll see what happens, but I just wanna clarify, that wasn't the Hadley School Committee rule, and that is part of um, the, the regulations. Um, in terms of when you can ask, not that you must then, but um, when you can ask. So then what do we do? If you test positive, um, the person who tests positive must isolate for a minimum of 10 days. Um, and uh, you can return to school after 10 days and once you, you've met the following criteria, which you can see. No fever, improvement in other symptoms, um, and there's an option to receive a clearance that's described here. Um, so the focus is on time and symptom resolution um, and they do not encourage repeat testing prior to return. So um, keep that clear. There is no like option to come to school. Like I'm fully vaccinated, but I got a breakthrough case. No, I say it's IIA, infected isolates always. So if you're positive, you're home. There is no, but I have on a mask and I got vaccinated. You're home if you're positive. Students and staff. So if you're an asymptomatic close contact, again, these protocols do not apply to people who are exempted from quarantine and test and stay. Asymptomatic fully vaccinated close contacts to people whose close contact was below under six, but over three feet and both children were masked in a classroom on the bus, um, or if somebody has had COVID in the last 90 days. And then what happens? Test and stay. So again, when you consent to pool testing, you're actually consenting to pool testing, to test and stay, that we can administer Abbott Binix now. And the way you would avoid that is you could keep your child home, so it's not going to be a forced thing. But what you're saying in that consent form is, yes, I want to participate in pool testing. If my child is an asymptomatic close contact who is not exempted from quarantining and test and stay, I am saying yes to test and stay, which our goal is that known faces, those four parents will help us with the test and stay program. And you're also agreeing to asymptomatic, excuse me, symptomatic COVID testing. If a child is feeling unwell, goes to the nurse, our school nurses can administer a rapid antigen test in the office to determine is this a cold or, does, or is this COVID? Um, so test and stay. A family says, you know, last year there was a complete nightmare where everybody was home and um, I'm gonna consent to test and stay. This means that you are asymptomatic, right? So you must be asymptomatic. You must, must wear masks at all time. Um, when you can't be masked, you're three feet away that's only eating and drinking. You must take the Binix Now test it would be administered for seven consecutive days, which essentially typically is five school days because um, two days are home. Um, and um, if an individual, um, yeah, and then um, actively monitor for symptoms for 14 days. Uh, if a family does not want to be in test and stay, then they must quarantine if they are a close contact that is not exempt from quarantining or testing uh, follow-up. And if you are symptomatic, um, you need to please get tested. And the duration is dependent upon uh, symptom resolution. And we would like to see a negative PCR test as, as well as being uh, without symptoms, uh, an improvement in symptoms and without fever for 24 hours, uh, without the use of fever reducing medications. Um, and if you don't want to do a COVID test to return to school, if you've tested positive, isolation is at least 10 days from symptom onset. If you found out you were positive from surveillance pool testing, um, uh, then uh, we still uh, expect that you have to, um, you still have to isolate. We don't want positive people at school. Um, all right. So again, these are all, I'm gonna stop share. I know that it's a lot. I want to remind people of where they can find it. It will be in my newsletter again this week.
uh, it is in the public folder where you access the school committee agendas. Um, and um, it is, it should be, I'll make sure that I link it into the dashboard. One of the tabs says DESI guidance, it says guidance. So as guidance comes out, you, know, you can find that on DESI's uh, website. I'll also put links in the dashboard. And I think that is everything, I'm sorry, face covering and hand hygiene and physical distancing. Face coverings, our board of health has, um, which I've also shared those in our, in our public folders, but our board of health has indicated what their expectations are. We are under a mass ordinance in the town of Hadley and the board of health has established what those criteria are. They're essentially the exact same criteria that we had last year in our fall reopening plan. Families did a great job of adhering to that and we appreciate it. Uh, we will still practice good hand hygiene and physical distancing is no longer something that is required, but as our principal indicated, um, to we, in, we implement physical distancing um, to every extent possible. Unfortunately, we're a small district and have small schools. So um, we are pretty good on that front. That's it. Great, thank you, Annie. Um, wow, what a, a, a shift from the, um, in clarity from DESI and DPH uh, this year. I really, I really appreciate the thoroughness with which they have provided guidance. Um, it reminds me of how um, we were all navigating our way through this alone as a school committee last year. Um, but I, I really, uh, I think we're in such um, so much better a position this year. Uh, any comments from my colleagues on uh, these um, guidance? Just the, the protocols are very thorough, Annie. And yes, it's a lot of information, but to me, it, it's laid out very clearly in terms of um, cases, exceptions, you know, all of the different scenarios. So thank you for walking us through that. Great. Okay. Thank you, team. And Annie, do we need to, we don't need to vote on this. This is a FYI. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on down the line, um, we have the review of the Hopkins Academy Handbook and summary of changes. Yes, yes. So in your, um, there's a link in the agenda, also in your packet, there's a summary of the changes. I won't read through these. The biggest uh, substantive change, I would say, is a revision in the dress code. That was done after uh, Principal Camuso met with um, a number of stakeholders and the changes that they made uh, are really focused, as it says, on trying to prevent any sort of implicit bias and inequities and to really uh, have conversations about what is considered uh, school appropriate attire to those to be conversations between parents and children. Um, so that's where that focus is. And other than that, it's not a lot of changes, but they're, they're not things like getting rid of the index. But again, you can read through those. If you had any questions, you can certainly let me know. Any questions for Annie? Okay, and you need a vote for? Yes, I do, please. Okay, do I have a motion? So move. Seconded. Terrific, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Great, thank you, everyone. All right, moving to the next agenda item. Um, do we have a principal update from Camuso? Uh, I'm sorry, we really don't, which is on me, but I would tell you that had she been here, she would have been able to just answer general questions. I can tell you that they're off to a phenomenal start. Parents of Hopkins Academy have probably seen how much information that Ms. Camuso and her team have shared with folks. Um, they are amazingly organized. And I believe that right now the enrollment as of this moment is 241 um, at Hawkins. I think that's what it is. My computer just went to sleep. I think we're right around 241 or 242 in this moment. And um, yeah, they've just done a phenomenal job. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, item E, summer retreat update. Yes, can we, I'm sorry, can we talk about that when we, um, just as more of a school committee, so just remember school committee that um, we are scheduled to meet on September 7th 
and on September 16th. And I believe, I wanna make sure I got the right time here. It's either 5 or 5.30, let me look right here. Um, so starting at five o'clock on September 7th and starting at five o'clock on September 16th, we're meeting at HES. Um, the school committee can certainly discuss if um, there's anything, uh, if there are any changes or adjustments that they wanna make to that. I will tell you what we have and you'll be, I'll put the agenda together for both dates. Um, I'll put the agenda together for both dates and you'll get it this week. So far we have um, uh, the capital plan, the discussion about Mass School Building Authority and uh, if we want to submit a proposal to Mass School Building Authority. The, whether or not in fall we're looking to submit anything to CPA or if we're waiting to spring for a CPA request uh, and looking at our enrollment data, looking at our diversity, equity, inclusion um, work and goals, defining expectations around family engagement um, and goals, our district strategy goals, review of our norms for our school committee, ESSER 3 funding, um, and I will have surveyed staff, students, the community, parents um, about their thoughts on how we should think about investing those funds. And I'll bring that survey data to the meeting. Um, our process for uh, looking at start time next year in our facilities we talked about. Um, and that is just about everything I have listed there. And I also will ask, um, because we are talking about buildings and, and our plans going forward and what major kind of renovations and or if we wanna submit a building proposal to MSBA, I will ask our consultant from Nexus Consulting to be available at some point during that meeting. So that's the person, uh, Paul Pfeiffer last year, I think you also walked around with him too, um, that does all of our commissioning on our HVAC systems. That's so we have an understanding. We know that we want to replace Univents if we're not in a new building. So he can uh, help us talk through that. Yeah. Terrific. Any questions of Annie about um, the summer retreat? Well, I know I had uh, uh, someone had brought up the question about um, are we still, do we want to do this in person? Do we want to do this virtually? Um, what are the committee's feelings about that, about how we would like to have the meeting? And uh, so I do want to make sure that we're still, that the agenda I'm putting together, the location, time and date still seems to work. Um, but certainly um, in person or virtual, I'm gonna confirm that. Yeah, you know, what I'm thinking is because it's a warm time of year still that we could probably do it socially distanced outside. Annie and I talked about maybe the um, pavilion at the elementary school and maybe a, a, a backup plan of a large indoor space um, at HES if needed, but probably wouldn't be needed even if it were kind of rainy, but I, I like the idea of getting us together in person. It's been a, a really long time and um, maybe we could try that for the first one and see how that works. Bring your mask, but I imagine that if we're socially distant and outside, we could probably be without masks. How do my teammates feel about that? I, I think it'd be great if we could meet in person. Uh, especially if we could unmask. I find it uh, long meetings like that with a mask on can be difficult. So I'd, I'd like the idea, Humera, I, I hate to say this, but it, I guess I heard that there was the first case of West Nile virus in Hadley uh, last week. And so there, you know, the Board of Health is cautioning to limit exposure in evening hours. So that's something to think about. So an indoor or larger space would be optimal if we can, we can find it. Go sit in a gym. Yeah. One of the schools. Right. Or the we are scheduled for the, um, I think you're scheduled right now for the cafe. We can easily change it to a different room yeah. in there. But cafe, yeah, the cafe sure. is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. The library would not be huge enough. Is that, is that true? Or might the library also work? That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, we, it would depend on how many people were there. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe we could reserve both and see, mm -hmm. figure sure. it out based on what it works out to be. Heather, you had a comment? 
I just said, sounds good. Meeting in person. That sounds fine. Up for it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Agreed. Okay. Excellent. Let's make it happen. I think it'd be really nice to see one another again. You know, I'm a big fan of Zoom meetings in order to, you know, for, for, for many reasons, but I think, I think this one would be better served with us together. Kimara, before I forget, that's why I was stumbling a bit on my words. I'm like, wait a minute, there's two things I have to make sure I do. Uh, pianos. So if we're good on the retreat, and if there are other topics you want me to add to the agenda, you, I don't expect people to remember that list, but in the calendar invite in the description is my running list that once it goes to an agenda, um, I'll make sure that we have that sorted out tomorrow. It'll stay in draft form in the school committee materials folder so the public can see it. You guys can see it. Um, and if you want to make any revisions, it'll get posted on Friday over at town hall. No, on Thursday at town hall because Monday's a holiday. Uh, there is nothing else, but I did um, want to suggest that maybe we send a look, just a very brief pre-materials for our colleagues to look at before the session. So you and I can work on that and send sure. something with their, with the agenda. Great. Terrific. Um, piano. Piano stuff. We have two pianos. Some of you have probably seen them as parents going to Hopkins, but are sitting in the Hopkins Cafe. I don't know, in my head, I'm like, I guess we wanted it to be like the Hyatt Sky Lounge at some point. They have not worked since I've been here. This is year eight. They haven't worked since before I was here. And our music teacher, um, as, and I believe also that he had talked with Eddie Foreman. These are the ones, not the baby grand in the music room, which we're going to have repaired, but this is the, um, the two in the cafe. So these are two upright pianos, or two pianos, sorry. The, the music teacher said they will not stay in tune, quickly go out of tune, broken key, keys. They're 60 to 70 years old and they haven't been used in over 10 years. Um, yeah, they are upright pianos. So he is asking that we can dispose of the asset and Chris is asking for a vote from the school committee or perhaps the school committee member would like one of them. Hmm. <laughs> Piano, that doesn't work. Does, does anybody have a trebuchet we could throw? In? <laughs> Just, yeah. Okay, so uh, do I hear a motion to dispose of the pianos and find a, a find a, find someone who might want that? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it would be great yeah. if it weren't in a landfill. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah. there's someone yeah. who would. We always do. So, so yeah. Annie, it sounds like we attempted to fix them, be in tune, but they won't stay. Fixed. Yeah, um, they won't stay in tune. Yes, the broken okay. keys, and so now it's compounding one thing over it. I see. The other one we are looking to get fixed that's in the music room. Terrific. So motion to dispose of the pianos and maybe find someone who would um, love to take it and do something with it. Uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. How about a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, terrific. You have, I think you have an approved disposition. Um, business manager reports. Is Chris? Here? No, it's September. Uh, he won't be at this meeting tonight. Okay. He'll be Chris. with us in September. And there are there isn't a tremendous amount of activity from last month in the summertime. You wouldn't have seen major changes. And he'll be with us in September. Terrific. All right. Um, on to school committee reports. Um, CES, Heather. Sure. So um, they didn't have a collaborative meeting this this month, but there is, the next one is at the end of September. So I will be attending that. Um, primarily, the activity has been, I think I shared with you, um, one of the director updates uh, and just a lot of um, obviously communication going out through the listserv, which I think all of you have seen around um, just prior to the commissioner's um, mask uh, release and ask of the board. You know, there was a lot of uh, just discussion on the on the collaborative. Um, sorry, I'm thinking about mask, but within collaborative, even the group just thinking about how different districts were handling um, mask mandates and return to school. Given a lot of folks, uh, school committee meetings were earlier um, this month prior to Commissioner Riley's um, uh, approval of the mask. Mandate. So that's it for now. I'll report back more um, when I meet with them at the end of September. Great. Thank you, Heather. And maybe 
um, we can think of a time when our the new executive director is um, ready to go on tour around the districts and um, perhaps give us an introdu introduction to who he is and what he's planning for CES. Doesn't have to that be, be Ethan soon, but that would be nice. Great, thank you. Uh, finance, Ethan. I think you're on mute. Muted. I'm not muted anymore. Goodness gracious. I think I would have learned by now. Um, there was a finance committee uh, meeting the 18th along with the select board, uh, but the finance committee portion of that meeting was just a presentation from the new town auditors uh, giving a, a solid presentation on the town's financial situation. And that's that's great. Thank you, Ethan. All right. Next uh, policy, Tara. Hi. So um, we met tonight um, very briefly to review um, two different things that came up. Um, one of them is MASC, the um, Mass Association of School Committee, um, had sent out emails for um, a suggested policy for face coverings. Um, I think a few weeks ago now that came out. You probably all saw it if, if you were able to review your emails. Um, and it's just a suggested policy in place to help districts um, uh, kind of coordinate um, face coverings. Um, and as we talked tonight, um, we didn't feel the need to put that policy into place right now, given um, the pretty clear guidance from both DESE and the local Board of Health. Um, we didn't really feel the need to go any further with that, but certainly in the future that, you know, there's those um, guidance there. Um, if we decide to adopt it in the future, if needed. So for right now, that's not something we decided to bring forward, but just so you know, we did look at it and discuss it. Um, the other thing that we discussed um, that we're asking um, to be approved in first reading um, is an adjustment to the home school policies. So um, what this is, is... Um, form IHBGE1 um, was simply rearranged, really. Um, it was reformatted to be in a little bit more user-friendly format um, for the Director of Student Services so that she can easily collect and report as needed. Um, no change in actual information was done, just simply how the form looks right now. Um, so that's something that we, we, I think we're asking if that can go through just a first and final reading today. To capture that. So again, no change in content at all, just kind of a change in how it how it um, is presented. I just realized something that I did. This is this is on me in trying to make these agendas uh, easy for me to manage. That uh, the entire school committee, uh, unless they're looking at the policy subcommittee um, agenda, the entire school committee would not see those changes. However, I am still comfortable. If the school committee is comfortable with the policy subcommittee's recommendation, I do want to underscore, this is not a change to policy, it's a reformatting of a form, but it's a form that's attached to a school committee policy, so we can't just reformat these without asking you. The reason that I'm asking for this to be approved this evening is because this is when people submit homeschool applications. So one of the things on the form is so parents don't have to type into these small type boxes and they can just provide us with attachments. Um, so I would still ask that um, if you were comfortable taking the recommendation of the policy subcommittee, that you would still uh, consider voting to approving us using the new form. I thought the form was a lot easier to read and um, there's no material changes. So it makes uh, a lot of sense to just go ahead and uh, approve this. We can share the, 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 what the change is in, by email after the fact and then revisit it if we need to. But I would, I would be comfortable motioning to approve this policy in light of the fact that, sorry, move to change the form, really. It's not really a change mm -hmm. of the policy. It's just a change of the formatting of the form. Um, so I would be happy to entertain a motion to do that. Yeah, I'm just saying, I, I don't think the formatting is really within our purview, given we're not the ones using the form. <laughs> it's more the policy that supports the use of the form. I'm in favor of, you know, make the form as useful as possible for whomever is using it. 
I'll just add, it does look more organized, not to make any bad statements about the person who organized it the first time. But when you look at the two side by side, it, it does look a little bit more formal and organized and easier to kind of read through. Definitely. Okay, so I think I heard a motion there from Heather. And uh, do I hear a second? Yeah, uh, second. Thank you, Paul. All in favor? Aye. 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 I can't wait to see the form. Pretty excited about the form. It's really beautiful. It's really yeah, beautiful. Nice, nice. That's what you signed up for in school committee. That's right. <laughs> and then um, do I need to say anything about JFBC? I know we have it in the action items, but did we need to bring anything up here at all with that? The last just to remind one? people, it's just the second and final. So this is originally you looked at VOC. We made small revisions to the language you looked at the small revisions that address the concern clarifying so this is the second and final reading to adopt it the smith vote yeah great so um because this is the second reading we would take a vote yep. tonight um, to pass okay. this policy so do i hear a motion to approve jfbc motion to approve policy jfbc preferred vocational school and do i hear a second second Okay, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks right. for working this one through, guys. <laughs> yeah, thank you for um, your willingness to uh, approve and then work with us to modify. That really worked out well to, to um, provide timely changes to the school as, as needed. Um, I think that is uh, fields and capital is the final uh, call. Yeah, the field. So the good news is the phase one um, contract was completed as of July 30th. So as of that date, we begin a one year warranty with the general contractor, Amasta. So great news about uh, phase one. Phase two, we've already started to get some draft numbers from Berkshire Design. Ask them to give us a, a quote for um, what it would cost them to do the designs for phase two, and then just ballpark what phase two might cost. Um, so when Chris gets back, I know we had some funds remaining, Annie, from the first phase. Um, and so I'm gonna see if we that those are sufficient to cover the cost of the design okay. for phase two. And if that's so, then you know we could bring it back to this group and talk about whether we wanna give them approval to move forward with that and what that would look like. And then I do think it's warranted to give a, an update to the CPA, but I know they're meeting on the 13th and the 27th mm -hmm. of this, of September. And I think you and I both can't make the 13th. I, I'm just not sure how pressing it is since I don't think it's a, we're in a timely manner to ask them for anything related to phase two yet. I would agree with you on that after you brought that up that they really appreciate very detailed proposals. So I don't yes. think we're in a position to be there on the 13th. And right. I do believe that CPA, I mean, at every town meeting, annual and special, there are warrant articles, I believe, from CPA. So yeah. it would just mean making a request uh, later down the road. Uh, I am not available on the 13th. We could probably give them an update on phase one in October. So their meetings in September or September 13th for presentations on CPA requests or to make presentations to request uh, CPA approval for projects that would be voted at special town meeting in October. And then they will vote on September 27th. It sounds like we could ask to get on their uh, agenda in October to provide them with an update. Right, either that or if we wanted, I think you said we had a, a school committee meeting on the 27th. No, that's the, which no. we'll also talk about this. It goes into our next meeting. I was thinking it was the 27th because it's the fourth uh, Monday, but we will need to look for it the previous Monday because it's also the trustees dinner, which of course you're right. all invited to on the 27th. Right. Um, okay. So that, yeah. That would gotcha. be a date that we could do either. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you for staying on top of that. Just a quick question on that. The goal would be to try to get a plan and request from CPA in order to potentially do phase two next summer when school is out. Well, no, I don't th I think that's ambitious, right? Um, Right, so we have Not to do the possible. I mean, in timeline, you know this better than I do, Paul, but if you're just talking voting timeline, right, what they're doing now is deciding what they're going to put on the warrant article for a special town meeting. Right. So they'll meet in the spring, which 
to your point, Paul, you know better than I, it's just too ambitious to get all the plans together. But in terms of their voting timeline, they're going to do something again before they decide what warrant articles will go on for the first Thursday in May, which so, if they did, then that would, but there are other factors at play, but certainly in terms of the vote, if all the paper, if, if the proposal were ready, we could, if the proposal were ready, there's time for a vote before the summer and next fiscal. Yeah, I mean, just given the numbers, if we're looking to at a comparable amount, if not a little bit more for phase two, we didn't get everything from CPA. So we had to fundraise and the trustees, obviously, and, and local you know, community organizations and banks and, and individuals were generous. So that took a lot of time to raise the money. We have to go through the Conservation Commission. Um, yeah, so, and then we have to bid it out, Andy, and that takes a couple of months, right? Yeah, so I forgot the obvious because that went really quickly last time. So you're right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I should uh, just started with, yeah, Paul, you're right. Um, yeah, as I was getting a little overzealous. So okay. maybe two summers from now. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Paul. All right. So uh, on to item seven announcements. Are there any announcements from my colleagues? All right, I have a quick announcement, and that is that um, Hadley Learns collaborated with the um, Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and the Senior Center um, to host a first ever um, World's Fair on August 4th, I believe it was, at the Senior Center, uh, outdoors and indoors. It was a, an incredible event, a potluck. We had foods from um, all, all kinds of cultures. We had very diverse population, a lot of school um, uh, folks, parents and kids, but also uh, it was very intergenerational, a lot of older folks and people trace back their lineage to wherever, wherever it was they were from before their family ancestors came to America and, and they brought dishes from, from that country. So it, it was such a great time. And, and I got emails immediately following asking for um, that same event to happen uh, in September, October, um, but it is an annual event. <laughs> we can only do so much, um, but I think it really pointed to the desire for community connection and to the extent that we can create that kind of um, social emotional support for families and kids. Um, potlucks are easy to put on and maybe something that is, um, is, is, uh, an easy, easy to put on event that happens throughout the year would be uh, a welcomed addition. I want to also add that um, Hadley Learns is collaborating with the same organizations and this time the um, Hadley Library, Friends of and the library itself, is um, to, to host a, a three-part um, Indigenous Matters event. We are watching um, a movie about the history of indigenous people in our region for uh, September. It'll, there'll be um, a special username and password that you can get to watch that movie, or you can come to an in real life event on the 10th of the month. And then a couple of weeks later, we'll be meeting with the director. He's a Peabody award-winning film um, person who's in our region and he'll come onto Zoom and speak with us about that film. In October, we'll be um, talking about the transition many communities have made from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. And um, so there's a list of resources that we've shared about that. And then finally for November and the, um, you know, coinciding with Thanksgiving, we will be uh, selecting from one of two excellent books about Indigenous Peoples um, history and present. So check out um, that information. It will be available in any uh, superintendent letter, um, as well as on the HadleyLearns.com website. Thank you. Sorry, I know that was a long announcement, but uh, thank you for hearing me out. Okay, so action items. Um, we need to approve the minutes for July 26. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Terrific. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, terrific. Um, approval of AP warrants for July 2021. And 
Uh, this is the one that I think, Heather, you abstain on, right? Okay, terrific. So do I hear a motion for the approval of the warrants? So moved. All right, second? Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, terrific, thank you. Now, the uh, approval of the warrants for July 2021, I think, is this the one that, Paul, you refrained from voting? Terrific. Okay, so do I hear a motion for this? So moved. Second. Okay. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, all right, terrific. We already passed policy JFBC, already approved the handbook edits. The next meeting date is? So I'm suggesting that we have September 7th, uh, and September 16th or strategic planning that September 27th is wrong because I'm suggesting September 20th since the board of trustees is on the 27th. Are people available on September 20th? I will be out of town. Okay, and out of town and also unavailable on Zoom? Same. Both, mm -hmm. okay. Um, shall we look at a date um, adjacent so I have to say that this fall, I will uh, be teaching again at Stanford on Zoom, and my classes are Thursday and uh, Tuesday and Thursday nights. So Mondays and Wednesdays continue to be free. Should we look at a different Monday, or should we look at a Wednesday? Wednesday is fine. Okay. And that Wednesday would be, uh, let's see, Heather, does that Wednesday work for you? 29th. That would be the either the 22nd or the 29th. Uh, I so sorry, go ahead, Heather. I was just gonna say I'm unavailable for both um, Wednesday, the 22nd and the 29th. Yeah, I actually have a problem that day too. Do we have a quorum on the 20th? I'm not trying to say, Heather, that you're not important, but do we? No, if you got a quorum, go with it. Yeah. And we said that the 27th was not good because we are, have been the Board of Trustees Center. Oh, sorry. Okay, terrific. Well, if we have a quorum, then we can continue with our plan of the Monday, the 20th. Uh, yeah. Let me just double check one other thing. That works for me. Anyone else expect that they won't be able to make it? Works okay. for me. It's good. All right. So Let's Heather, we'll miss you. I'll miss you guys. We'll miss you too. You're going to be doing something fun? Going to try to. Good. There you go. All right. We'll we'll send you some minutes. I will still go. send you. I'll still send you the calendar invite, Heather. Um, Thank you. Just in case you want to see the uh, anything that's attached to it, and I'll send that out now. Okay. And then um, I, I just quickly before you do have a very brief executive session, and you're not going to reconvene and open. But for open session. Um, I'm recommending that we pull the capital item given um, the healthy balance of school choice at this point. If you recall, we still had about $50,000. I think it was a tech article for about $50,000, a request for a uh, special town meeting in the fall. Um, we received in June an additional uh, $200,000 in school choice receipts for last year. And on top of that, we have um, our ESSER three funding, which can be used for tech. So um, it seems like the, it's, it just seems, I would say it's the right thing to do to um, not request the town. Pay for Andy, the thank you so much for bringing it up. You're right. Uh, there's no need to request that from the town. I think we can cover it if we need it. So um, do you need a vote from us to do that? Well, I suppose you folks should be in agreement on that because I think you voted the capital doesn't mean we're changing the capital plan. So no, actually you don't need to vote. It wasn't, you didn't vote on what you're sending to town meeting. The capital plan isn't changing. We're just gonna pay for it ourselves is what we're saying. So if I don't hear any objection, I'll just, you know, go ahead. Does anyone that. object to that strategy? Do we agree with it? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, terrific. All right, well, my personal goal for our meetings is to keep it to uh, an hour and a half or less and Perfect. check it out. Check yeah, it. well done. Look we at that. are there. <laughs> All right. So, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Uh, this meeting, but remember, you have to um, convene your exec executive session. That's what I'm yeah. Saying. Motion to go into executive session to discuss strategy um, with regard to contract negotiations with non union personnel and to not reconvene an open session. Second. All in favor? Oh, roll call. Uh, 
Nope, not true. Roll call. Roll, Roll call. Vote. Oh, and Ethan, I heard an aye. 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 Paul, thank you. And Tara? Aye. Heather? Yes. Aye. And Humira, aye. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, all who attended. And um, um, we will be back next month.